C-Tag Studios proudly presents... A short and special St. Patrick's Day episode of... The Almost Daily Zencast. With your host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. Welcome and namaste, friends. Let's get started. Today's little episode is going to be brief because it's essentially a public service announcement. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I wish you loads of fun and joy and good times with your friends and or family. And I beg you, my dear friends, my fellow humans and beings, don't drink and drive. Drink to be merry, drink to celebrate, don't drink to excess. It's bad for your liver, it's bad for your lower intestine, it's bad for your bunghole. Um, and <laughs> that's all scientific fact. Um, and, uh, and yeah, a DUI... I can personally assure you from research and direct experience is not worth the brief amount of fun you may or may not have getting that drunk before you get into the car. I know it's like a wet towel topic. I know it's a party thing. You know, party people don't give a shit. And I, and I know uh, that... The culture in the United States around drinking is established so that most individuals think that they're uh, indestructible and impervious to the problems of uh, the slippery slope of alcoholism or alcohol addiction or addiction in general. First of all, to anybody who is scared or concerned that they may have a drinking problem, I wanted to make this part of the show, I want to stop and send you love and energy. If you're kind of caught off guard by this and are wondering, Ugh, or just feeling defensive, I send you some reassurance and some love and some patience and some compassion right now. It's important for all of us to realize, whether we drink or don't drink, it's important to acknowledge that our societal norm not only is accepting in a sort of open-minded way, it is commercially uh, manipulative about drinking this toxic concoction. Because no matter how much fun we've ever had, uh, and trust me, I'm a former like heavy drinker. Uh, and I say former because now I am indulging in a long-term period of uh, sobriety from alcohol uh, and trying to drink as little as possible. I'm acknowledging that I'm not trying to achieve 100% sobriety from alcohol. Uh, and I know I've got friends out there who understand this this feeling. We're not trying to prove that we're not, you know, anything specific. We're just minimizing it to the bare minimum while still respecting our free will, our own free will to intelligently and with extreme uh, moderation, extremely vetted moderation, extreme, because um, everything's extreme these days, you know, occasionally choose to do so under like complete lockdown safety situations. And I know that sounds weird and crazy, but trust me, as a person with, with a lifetime of direct personal experience with drinking as a social norm with drinking as something that you do politely over dinner with drinking as something that you do to relax with with drinking as something that you do to party with is drinking something you do to get shit faced with 
And with, you know, having known lots of people and just being the observer of culture and society that I, I'm kind of naturally inclined to be, it is fair and reasonable and correct and just to question why it is in our society uh, it is not just acceptable, it is almost sort of glorified and 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 encouraged for people to chronically consume what is essentially just poison, toxic poison. Even, you know, and they go, they go to the extent to make it fancy looking and taste yummy, but at the bare bones, at the bottom, at the, at the bottom line of it, the, the, the chemical components of alcohol, no matter which form it comes in, is toxic poison. It's like if they somehow managed to convince us to drink plastic. Except, you know, not quite as directly, intensely. Um, and I love a, an awesome hoppy IPA. And I really uh, enjoyed in, in my life, you know, a, a dark, rich, complex red wine, etc., etc. I'm not here to judge those who drink. I'm not here to judge those who have a drinking problem. I'm not here to judge anybody. I am here to encourage you, dear listener. To step up with the like taking personal responsibility and maybe taking some time to contemplate it, meditation or otherwise, sort of just analyze your relationship with this drug. Because no matter how normalized it is and how encouraged it is in our society, it's a drug. It's a drug in that way that, ironically, cannabis can sort of, you know, you can kind of draw a line and be like, cannabis is really much less of a drug with capital letters than alcohol is. Um, but of course, there's still a lot of disagreement on the subject because of, um, you know, several decades worth of propaganda and anti-cannabis um, conditioning. But on St. Patty's Day, there is some comedy to be had, my friends, that if you really think about it, uh, you know, if you're going to drink a green beer, you're just doubling down on, like, the toxic waste you're putting in your body because you're drinking alcohol, which is, by definition, toxic to your body. It's why you get drunk. Your body's literally – why, if you continue drinking, you puke because your body's warning you, like, this is not safe – to drink in large quantities, this is not safe to replace water with. Uh, and that's why you ultimately sort of don't feel well and you black out. And although it can be have a brief window of funness, which is where we should all respectfully, like, stop and, um, you know, somehow uh, contain our relationship with alcohol, uh, arguably, in a sort of balanced society. And then in, even at that level of safe consumption we should just plan to not drive ourselves home because the, there is where they where the system sort of really gets us because there is valid science that, that indicates that driving home with more than a couple of drinks in you is much less safe than just driving when you haven't had any of any, any alcohol in your system for you know 24 hours um, and one of the fascinating facts about the body and the system is that that you know uh, when you get a, your driver's license or you go to the DMV or whatever, you often get this little chart um, with the weird kind of blocks and, the, and it, it lays out like body size, you know, poten you know, and potential time that it might take to um, to work out uh, x amount of drinks from your body. That chart's actually technically incorrect because of uh, a a bunch of variables that are not represented in that data. And B, the fact that it actually take that some for some people it just takes three times as long, uh, even though they may fall in that chart. That's just a known thing, and that potentially, like if you drank really late into the night and then got up the next morning to be at work by ten, you might, by all technical definitions, be DUI qualifyingly drunk on the drive to work. Uh, and that's shocking. And most people are like, no, but I slept and I ate dinner and then I had breakfast and I'm a little hungover. Uh, but in all honesty, and I'm not 
saying this to be critical of drinkers or drinking. And my sobriety is not something I'm bragging about. Uh, I, I desperately miss drinking. It is St. Paddy's Day. I'm probably going to choose a drink today. Um, but I may not. I'm sort of... One of the other things that I want to bring to this uh, PSA and not let it drag on for too long is that I can tell you that from a, a personal experience, half a lifetime of drinking responsibly and very moderately and, and, and very rarely to an excessive place of partying has still been really hard on my body, and I feel it, and my body lets me know. Uh, and I don't want to sound weird or awkward or strange, but that's important. And that's really important for young people to consider. And our culture, our society, and the oppressive system of uh, profiteering on us with everything does not encourage that sort of deep thought. You know, it in- our entire society is about leveraging your ego into the driver's seat if it wasn't already. That's what the conditioning's about, which is why they don't give two shits if you plow yourself and your drunk ass friends into uh, you know the side of the freeway uh, and hit the dividing wall and et cetera et cetera. California is sort of an egregious example. Uh, uh, back east, American cities are structurally speaking a lot more like they are in Europe because of the historical context of when they were originally built and laid out. People walked or rode horses. Everything's like closer, more compact, less spread out. California was built out in the apex of the age of the indestructible car that was going to last forever and that everyone you know, was going to have one uh, at a cheap, affordable price. And, and the car ruled. It was the, the apex, the, the shining, bright, sort of apparently golden era of the height of, the, of oil establishing itself as the, you know, the key central point of modern society and sort of the owners of everything. Uh, so we didn't get fun, well-laid-out, interesting, tightly-built, community-oriented, upward-reaching, concise little cities that where we could safely go out and drink and get that fun, tipsy party drunk and walk home safely. We didn't. We had to, We got a, a, an entire state laid out where just to go to the grocery store or the post box or to take your kids to school, you got to drive 15, 20, 30 minutes on average minimum. And then for a large portion of us, we're, we're driving even further than that just to do our daily life. So while I respect those in the process of recovery and those who facilitate that process immensely, and I applaud them for the hard work that they're doing, we all together as human beings also have to maybe contemplate and could potentially acknowledge that maybe just maybe there's some sort of profiteering scheme right here in the blueprint of you almost necessarily uh, by default in California have to drive away from your house to go socialize and have fun and enjoy a little bit of toxic poison that tastes yummy. Uh, and I say, you know, I'm a big supporter of free will and for letting the universe sort of teach us what is and is not good for us. And, I, and I'm and i controversial because I conversely, uh, while I sort of have feel that my life has been a, 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 tough, a, a tough and direct personal lesson on the slippery slope that is alcohol and that there is a time and a place to, to consume it um, – with the with the most powerful of best intentions, where it can actually serve like good healing and spiritual purposes. So it's not like I'm a teetotaler that wants to ban it. I'm not. I never want to ban anything. You know, if people want to be drunkards, then let them be drunkards. But can we give them a safe place and a safe way to do it, and some healthcare to support them in their drunkardliness? Because I know that sounds crazy and radical, but I think that's what all the teachers of all the prophets, all the ascended masters were trying to teach us. Not to its support addictions, mind you, but to accept people for what they are in whatever condition we encounter them and do our best to help them. Not just survive, but thrive. Through the transmission of real, compassionate, powerful, forgiving love. Uh, and if I've learned anything through my personal trials and tribulations, 
uh, is that as I like to try to communicate in my themes, one of the magical ingredients of that is, is real, honest, compassionate communication between individuals. Um, Anyways, I'm rambling on a bit long, and I really just meant this to be a simple, straightforward sort of, like, public service announcement. Please, 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 if you happen to hear this today or in some future date, and you, deep down, and I'm not trying to make you feel angry or defensive or, or, or judged because I'm not judging you. I've done th- – I've learned my – I can speak to this because I lived this denial and had to have the rude awakening of, like, oh, God, I do this. But if you find yourself occasionally or more than occasionally driving home 10 minutes after you've had three beers instead of two hours after you've had three beers, um, you know, those signs out on the freeways are, are, are unfortunately, tragically true. They're being used against us. The whole, this whole set of facts are being used against us to sort of profiteer on us uh, in a really horrible way by the, by the state. Um, but... You know, buzz driving is drunk driving. So we just need to make a hard core commitment culturally to being of service to one another um, at the personal and interpersonal and the you know, amateur semi-professional level. By amateur, I mean like you can do this for folks that are not your close intimate friends. You can provide – you can organize in your community to set up a volunteer organization that that sort of either – pays for free Uber rides or provides free personal, I'm going to drive you home, dude. And my other friend's going to take your car and drive your car home because you should not get behind the wheel. Because as awkward and as difficult and as strange and as much of a burden as that can sometimes feel, if and when you do that, you are literally saving someone's life. Because it's just a numbers game, my friends. If if people go home drunk, there's this mythos in drinking culture that if you, once you know where your where your limits are, you can drink just enough to be able to totally safely drive while still being really not sober. And it may feel like that sometimes. It may perceptually occur to like be a verifiable thing, but ultimately, over time, there's statistical fluctuations on how well you're going to be able to handle sudden and bizarre and unexpected events on the road and you're going to get hurt or worse you're going to hurt someone else or worse you're going to die and that's a horrible way to die I'm not here to tell anyone to never drink again I'm just sharing a, one of the deeper sort of harder layers of my reality what's really going on with me. That's what this podcast is about. I'm not here to make you believe what I believe in. I'm just throwing it out there for you to consider. Uh, Go out, have fun, be safe. Remember to, to, you know, put that extra bit of money in your bank account or, you know, or on your credit card so you don't run out of money at the end of the night so that you can't get an Uber. Or better yet, just Uber there and Uber back. I know it's more expensive and that's crazy, but... Those are the best. That's really the best option besides a dedicated, committed system that's well organized and like that there's real strength in the support about and in the commitment to each other about amongst your friends. Someone needs to be the sober driver, like sober driver, not three beers in. I feel okay and I'm the least drunk of you all because that's actually worse, believe it or not. Most people don't understand the way their community, their state, and our county address DUI issues. And there's actually a, quite a huge variance from county to county, never mind from state to state. Uh, and sometimes being in a car load full of drunk people, being the least drunk, is uh, like they take a little bit stronger, they have a bit more leeway to be harsh on you uh, because you're still driving and you're all crazy drunk. And each of you are drunk in public. I, I want to be clear. I've, I think I've said it enough, but I, I want to end on this note. I'm never, I'm never an, like an abstainer. I'm not going to tell you what not to do. Uh, I'm never going to command others to be like, you're not allowed to do this or you must do that. 
I am just here to share my thoughts on issues that we all have common to us in the human experience and encourage you to consider my take on them. And just know that there's great if you if you're into karma and you believe in that, there there's it's nothing but being of service to be available to take care of someone and make sure that they, they get home safely and that they don't hurt themselves or hurt someone else. Uh, that's that's um, that's really cleansing and healing and growth promoting uh, in the way karma works. I think I've addressed before in, in previous episodes that we have a really skewed interpretation or understanding of how karma works in pop culture here in Western society. It is not a, a scorecard of points nor is it like a voodoo doll of like, oh, the universe is going to get back at you for pissing me off. Mm-mm. And it, it isn't something that you can tabulate directly either. You, you can't keep a, your own accounting of karma. It is an organic flow of the momentum in your manifesting life that's that's functioning in the probability wave form of all the potential potentialities that you live through as you choose moment by moment in this maze that we exist in called reality. So we have to kind of tap into the OG sources and really revisit um, some authoritative uh, you know, authors on, on subjects like that. And I just point that out because... Um, It's easy to flippantly say, well, drunk drivers, that was just their karma. Like, yeah, but not helping them is ours. Not helping them lands squarely on our chest and in our futures and in our flow of karma. And like I said, it's not a point system. It isn't like, oh, I I gained five points because I did a good deed and I lost five points because I did a bad deed. It's not, that's not how it works. It's an aggregate collective across dimensions and across lifetimes. Um... And it is tied to the it, what it's relating to is not the individual consequences of your current life. Uh, many people who live in horrible consequences have lots of great karma. They have they have an overwhelming amount of of of, of quote unquote good karma, but maybe their circumstances are still kind of shitty uh, according to some norm normative or statist or, or or you know wealth based measure or metric, but that. See, we, that's, that's all part of the confusion of how they, we have as, as participants in Western society allowed ourselves to cling to misinterpretations of some of these deeper ancient truths. All we need to do is go back and revisit uh, for ourselves and, and with each other in terms of being a thinking community uh, some, some older writings about the ancient stuff. I think a great launching point as any any old school follower probably will guess, is um, uh, you know uh, the two books I recommend to everybody, Alan Watts, The Way of Zen, and Karen Armstrong's The History of God, because they are an amazing platform to go. Oh, now I have a a, a way to a map to look at research, real research, into all of these things that isn't tainted by the current. Because this is from a couple like a generation and a half ago where the, the journalistic spirit uh, was so much more clean and, um, and, uh, and you know, the, the, the cause of, of reporting real facts to the best of an intellectual sort of test of, of worthiness to be called the truth and be put in a book and shared for everyone's consumption instead of it being an entertainment media, you know, there was a big, there was a stronger division in those fields. So these books are are really not about conning you into supporting someone's personal wealth pyramid scheme. These books were written for the intellectual pursuit of the truth uh, in a way that's much more rare today. I'm not saying no one does it. I'm saying it was just these these two are strong with it and it's powerful. And they they give you an enormous resource, resource of deeper, older books to go diving into that are, you know, not just what they researched to touch on or to get catchphrases from, 
but their lifetime's journey of loving books and loving the research that they're doing. Really beautiful books, and they don't tell you what to think. They just share you the facts that they've found. It's they two key inspirations to sort of how I aspire to operate um, and uh, and talk about things on these these little meme shows. So yeah, to sort of reel back, today's is a happy celebration of St. Patrick's Day. I don't have any cool historical factoids of St. Patty's Day or anything like that because, um, as always, I kind of just didn't know what I was going to talk about until I started powering up the machine. And then I remembered it was St. Patty's Day. And uh, I just wanted to, you know, applaud it, support it, and make, make a strong impression in case, you know, a strong argument for taking that extra step. Uh, to ensure your own safety and the safety of others and and encourage you to, to maybe consider really taking that extra step, the spiritual calling step, and see what you can do, even on a tiny once-in-a-while, case-by-case basis of offering that safety to others your, from your close friends, people you know through work, people you know through your cir- social circles or your you know, whatever organizations you belong to, or find it out if there's a volunteer system. There's often in many communities, especially communities that have a higher than average, you know, DUI rate uh, of occurrence, they have volunteer Friday night safe, Friday night live, all kinds of stuff, often organized through Alcoholics Anonymous, um, which, by the way, even if you don't drink or you don't think you have a drinking problem, Finding an interesting Alcoholics Anonymous group and attending for a spell for a season, I sometimes recommend, you know, anything. If you're trying to learn something new, you've got to stick to it for like nine months before you really know if you've achieved anything with it because that's just the way nature works. You spent nine months in your mother's womb. It's an indelible pattern that we shouldn't just constantly ignore for the rest of our lives. Um, And there's, anyways, there's ancient writings to that effect uh, or ancient people talking about it i think maybe i'm making that up i don't know i'm a little crazy and i'm sort of lost track of my time i need to get going because i need to get going i got stuff to do here and in other dimensions so be safe my friends be strong and uh be moderate if you're consuming your future body self your liver your your stomach your lower intestines your bunghole they will thank you if you Maybe explore, if you've had a rowdy, intense, you know, drinky good time during your 20s, it isn't lame or weak or sad or pathetic to mellow the fuck out and drink a shit ton less. It's actually quite good for your health and you get, you know, the best of both worlds. You get to still enjoy the process and the savoring and and the the, the euphoria of being just the right amount of less than sober. Um, and you you know and you just end the era of the humiliation and the pain and the suffering and the mess and the puking and the awkward um, unsuccessful attempts at you know intimacy with strangers when you drink like a like your grandparents might <laughs> over dinner uh, anyways I'm not here to tell anyone what to do uh, I just want you all to be safe Sending you much love and uh, and peace and grooviness. And I hope you all enjoy your night out tonight and this weekend. Uh, and I look forward to all the um, delightful photographs of wild, crazy people dressed up in, you know. I love that St. Patrick's Day has become a bit like Halloween, where for women, there's sort of this trend. And I, I, I'm not saying that this is healthy. I just think there's comedy to it. As social commentary, but Halloween has become like, how sexy can your costume be? Um, or to some in some circles, at least about sexy costumes. And I think that there's, you know, it's fair that that should be equal. I, I like, I pre- and I mean to acknowledge that that there's often a bit of that happening too. Like, se- damn, that's a sexy Halloween costume for you, dude. Um, and that's how, I, like, I try to approach it, not in a raunchy way necessarily. It doesn't have to be raunchy. But am I crazy or am I imagining this? Or is St. Patrick's Day kind of creeping in that same general direction? Uh, And it's becoming like, who's got the sexiest St. Patty's Day green, you know, tank top bikini combo? I I don't know. 
Um, but men, step it up a notch. Get sexier out there. Uh, and and t- try to uh, tie all those loose ends of comedy together. It's very sexy to step up and take responsibility uh, and offer your friends, loved ones, um, and without being fucking creepy and weird, strangers, uh, this is a moral calling, not an opportunity to take advantage of people, uh, which should not be... Uh, on the flip side, let's, let's, let's explore this for a hot second before we end. If you're drunk or if you have friends or acquaintances that are getting drunk that are being offered ride homes, it is perfectly reasonable to be suspicious of the person. Uh, you know, only trust people with, through Uber or through some sort of organized volunteering system that has, you know, the, the, in, that you've done a little, that you can do a little bit of research on. Um, you know, be safe, be smart is my point. Uh, I know that there's, the, you know, a whole group of people out there in, in the world and in, you know, everyone's social circle that's sort of like the cat herder. And I'm sort of looking at you folks to help spread this message if you're listening to this particular episode at any time. Uh, you know, we know who we are, the ones that can, that can enjoy uh, and kind of keep up with the, with the party but also still manage to organize the group and not just be completely hammered and dysfunctional <laughs> but capable of walking and talking. Uh, so we're the ones that usually feel a little burdened by the fact that we got, we've got to make sure everyone – gets to where we're going or, you know, gets back to where we came from, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a special calling in this universe, especially in this time and place where we live under this culture of uh, of how strongly they, they market us, this intoxicant. Um, as always, moderation and responsibility and giving a shit about your friends and about other people is the path to figuring out how to solve that problem. Okay, thanks again for listening. I'm going to wrap things up, and I'm going to strongly and firmly believe that together we can all make a dis- a difference in this world. If you've just discovered this little podcast, please uh, click like, follow, share, all the typical social media marketing stuff. Uh, honestly and, and humbly, um, if you appreciate what I'm sharing or what I'm talking about, just and you have been listening, because someone's listening, uh, the numbers keep going up in a, in a way that is encouraging. Uh, I'm not trying to get famous. I'm not trying to get rich. I'll always want to offer this kind of stuff for free, um, but I do need to sort of build it up so I can reach a broader audience and achieve a higher level, be on a higher platform. And you can help with that. Inbox me if you're interested. Peace out, folks.